What a pleasant surprise that the Green Bay Packers were last season. The youngest roster in the NFL went out, made the playoffs, pulled off a victory against the Cowboys, and then went on their road to San Francisco and put up a heck of a fight. And this is a team that is going to be going into this season with a lot more expectations and a team that I could just be excited to say, I'm really looking forward to seeing how they grow together. It's still one of the younger rosters in the league. And the Packers have somehow found a way to keep a championship contending level window open even after losing their hall of fame quarterback because they are on to the next one because jordan love was that good last season so the packers are coming in as my number 13 team in the nfl going into 2024 and i have a whole lot of things to talk about about why i love this team and i love their head coach let's get into everything the overall grade of this head coaching staff isn't going to grade out nearly as good as the man leading the show in Matt LaFleur, but a big part of that's just going to be because they hired Jeff Halfley to be their defensive coordinator. I find it hard to believe it's going to be worse than Joe Barry, but, you know, coming from college at you know, he's the head coach of Boston College, I'm a little on the fence about the hire as a whole, but, you know, rookie defensive coordinator coming in from college ultimately i'm not going to knock them too much i'm just going to kind of wait and see how it plays out overall it's not going to knock my overall grade of the packers because like i said hard to be worse than joe barry and two you have matt lafleur as your head coach and man I have to really say he was incredible last season and I have so much praise for him. It's really funny how this is the episode coming after the Cowboys won. In the Cowboys last episode, I ranted a lot about Mike McCarthy and how a lot of these coaches have just kind of coasted on the success that they had with Aaron Rodgers and guys like Nathaniel Hackett and Joe Philbin and other guys have just really let themselves build a career just off coaching Aaron Rodgers and Rodgers tolerating them. And it was really interesting going into this season because LaFleur had success with Aaron Rodgers, but ultimately couldn't get to the Super Bowl, you know, back-to-back -back MVPs and everything with Rodgers. But going into this year, it was really much a big prove-it season for LaFleur, who kind of had a lot of people, they were on the fence about him. They didn't know if he was really the guy, if he was just another, you know, idiot with Rodgers or, or whatever the case was. And it was also really interesting that he kind of went to the season and said, I want to run my stuff this year. You know, when I got, when I inherited Aaron Rodgers, I kind of let Aaron run the show. I, I adapted to him. I did what he wanted to do. But now this season, we're doing what I want to do. It left me feeling cautiously optimistic because, you know, a lot of guys just kind of try to do what they did with Aaron Rodgers. And obviously not every quarterback is Aaron Rodgers. So, you know, it doesn't come to be as successful. But LaFleur had his own mindset and what he wanted to do and the vision he had for the offense. And Jordan Love was his guy. And man, it was so good to watch last season. I thought he did an incredible coaching job. And I rank him as the number three head coach in the league in that top tier of he's number two or number three, I feel like. I think there's a legit argument to be made that he's number two. After the season that he had last year, I have no doubts about how good Matt LaFleur is. There was a lot of people questioning him beforehand, but there should be no questions now. Matt LaFleur is one of the best in the league, and what he was able to do in his offensive vision was really fun to watch. He really solidified himself as not just some Aaron Rodgers dependent guy like a lot of other people. He was creative. He was doing things that he hadn't done in years previously and when he said that hey i want to run my stuff and i have my own way of doing things and he was not wrong and his way worked to perfection especially in the second half of the year once everything started to really click for this team jordan love put everything together in the second half of the season they were on a tear on the offensive side of the football and now this is a team that added josh jacobs and goes from being the youngest team in the league and they got another year of growth and they're together again. This receiving core is together. This offensive line is, you know, didn't have David Bakhtiari for last season and for a lot of the past few seasons. So it's not like Bakhtiari some big loss. They weren't playing with him anyway. So this team on the offensive side of the football mostly is together. And it's going to be nice to have that continuity, have Jordan Love in his second full season as a, a quarterback for his team. It's going to be really great to see if LaFleur can continue to build upon what he did last season. And I really think he can. 
surely the Packers just can't keep getting away with this because how have they found themselves potentially their third QB in a row? Because Jordan Love last season showed you everything you need to see in a guy to be a franchise quarterback and going out and throwing 32 touchdowns and over 4,000 yards and leading your team to a playoff victory and playing tough against the 49ers and having just an incredible second half of the season stretch last year. I was tempted to put him into the top 10, couldn't do it, settled at 11th in the league, but I do still have him taking a step up. You know, he's a quarterback who I have as a B grade and I have him taking a leap. So man, he's going to probably crack into that top 10 potentially this season. And he's still only 25 years old. I know it feels like he's been around forever because, you know, he was sitting on the bench for a couple of seasons now, but he's still just 25 years old. So there is plenty of time for this team and there's plenty of time for Jordan Love to have an amazing career here in Green Bay and potentially do what his predecessors had also done and get them a Super Bowl ring. I can't really say that I have any doubts that Jordan Love's season last year, or at least the second half, was like some just hot streak and he's just going to come back down to earth and have a, a pretty middle of the pack season next year like I think he is better than just some middle of the pack quarterback who got hot for a couple of weeks like this is Jordan Love this is what he is he had the talent coming out of college but he was raw he needed to sit for a little bit and it shows that you know hey one that draft pick was good two you know it still works to sit some quarterbacks down every once in a while I know we're in a age where you, you know you just want that instant gratification of like hey is this the guy is this not the guy and a lot of rookie quarterbacks are going to be going through that this year but Jordan Love has sat on the bench and watched as first round picks that have been drafted after him have not only been drafted started flamed out and been like knocked out of the league basically all in the time that Jordan Love was just sitting on the bench I mean like that's crazy that Love has gotten the patience from the Packers that he has gotten because you had the luxury of sitting behind Aaron Rodgers. But it's nice to see that still in this age, you could have patience with a guy. You could just sit him down for a little bit. And hey, he rewarded the Packers by just coming out and having an amazing season. And just when you thought the window was shut and this team was hitting a reset button and transitioning to a super young group that's going to take a couple of years to succeed. Nope, they were successful in year one. And you got the coaching quarterback of the future. You know, Matt LaFleur certified that guy. Jordan Love certified that guy. And now the team's got a Super Bowl window open all over again. And they have immediately capitalized on that and bringing in a guy like Josh Jacobs and, you know, continuing to add on the offensive line, replacing David Bakhtiari with Jordan Morgan, who you hope is going to fill in those shoes at least adequately. You just want to see Love do what he did last year as he did have some Aaron Rodgers level throws last season. I mean, some of the off platform plays that he was able to make, he has a very interesting, you know, footing when it comes to his throwing. You know, I wouldn't even just say it's his footwork, but like some of the times that he just fades away and throws the football. He'll jump up and throw the football. Like his footing does not affect his arm as much as other quarterbacks do. You know, some quarterbacks need to have their feet set, load up and step into the throw and everything. Jordan Love not only doesn't need that PD actively, will throw some beautiful passes fading away, falling over to the side. And you look at him and it's like, man, there's a little bit of Aaron Rodgers in there. And it's like, did, how much of that did he learn from Aaron? And how much of that did he just have there in there now? Naturally. So he already makes some Rodgers like throws and I don't want to just come out and say he's Aaron Rodgers because I don't think he'll be that good. I mean, you know, saying he's a top five, top 10 quarterback of all time is, uh, you know, that's a, that's a lot to say, but he's got some of those throws in him. He's got some of those plays in him. He made some beautiful passes down the field. He's got a great arm. He throws it at every level very effectively. You know, the way he just can throw it off platform, though, is just spectacular. And he's already, you know, first year as a starter coming in and showing he's one of the best in the league at that already. I don't see that being skills that just go away after a season. So anyone who thinks this is maybe just a, you know, a guy who caught fire for a couple of weeks and he's going 
going to go back down and be a middle of the pack quarterback. I, I would really reevaluate that take and kind of go back and really watch what Jordan Love was able to do last season. This is a guy who's going to be here for a long time and be really, really good for a long time. How about going out and kind of hitting the upgrade button on the running back? Because yes, Aaron Jones did come in as my 13th best running back, but I think you have kind of taken a step up. I had Aaron Jones as a B graded player. I have Josh Jacobs as a B plus. So I think it's an upgraded player getting a top 10 running back. And I know his his numbers last year and his production was bad, but the Raiders uh, perpetually live in dysfunction and things did get better with you know Antonio Pierce coming in and kind of establishing the culture and everything but it was still a rough year overall from a guy like Josh Jacobs and I'm not you know in the belief that he is just all of a sudden not a great player you know he's still 26 so for that running back you know clock you know 29 is when you get worried I'm not worried at 26 quite yet so I'm more inclined to believe he's closer to the guy that we seen in 2022 where he had over 1600 yards and was just an absolute monster and I think he's going to a lot more of a stable st situation because I like the Raiders now but I, I didn't like them before with the, the constant issues with Josh McDaniels and the team and the lack of just everything that that team had and they still don't have a quarterback at this point so he's going to a team where he doesn't have to be the guy where he gets 340 carries like he did in 2022 and he has to just go and run for an insane amount of yardage he doesn't have to be the team's everything he doesn't have to be what he's been his entire career with the Raiders which is the driving force behind this offense he just has to be a guy who can handle the ball 250 times get you over a thousand yards put up as many touchdowns as possible and you know do his thing you know he doesn't need to be the guy commanding all the attention on the box because teams would load up the box on Josh Jacobs because no one else was scaring you on the Raiders even though you have Devontae Adams and everything it's like well you don't got a quarterback who can get him the football and you know he doesn't have to do that he's got a quarterback standing next to him who can you know actually make you pay he's got receivers that you know we'll get into that are going to be at least dangerous enough to command some respect from defenses so he doesn't need to be the dominant driving force so I think Jacobs was a good signing for this team and it was good to get Jordan Love somebody that can make this team even more dangerous because you know if you try to stack the box on Jordan Love well he'll pull that football out on play action he'll you know toss it over the top of your head Aaron Jones was a great running back but Josh Jacobs is a more punishing runner of the football and makes you really just pay the price and even if you're a little skeptical of the the transition even if you think it's just like a lateral movement and Josh Jacobs isn't that much better than Aaron Jones even if you think that you have to consider the fact that Josh Jacobs is you know, he turned 26 already this season, and he's going to stay 26 until next February. So, you know, he's got a lot of years left in him compared to a guy like Aaron Jones, who by season's end will be 30 years old. And I already said 29 to 30, that's kind of the death spot for the running back. So you're at least getting a couple more years of a quality back. So, you know, Josh Jacobs, I, I love the fit and I love what he's going to potentially bring to this offense. And you're hoping he doesn't have to turn things to A.J. Dillon because A.J. Dillon was pretty bad last year. And a guy who got 170 carries, you're really hoping A.J. Dillon does not have to touch the ball that much because he is truly, uh, for a guy that big and that size and that build and that archetype, he does not run like a guy that big. He runs more like a smaller back who's scared of contact at times. Like he does not bowl anybody over. He doesn't break tackles. He doesn't do much for a guy his size. So, you know, you can maybe see why a team would want to draft a guy like Marshawn Lloyd in the third round. Now, I'm not a big Marshawn Lloyd guy. I kind of compared him to DeAndre Swift, I believed, as a guy who... Uh, just doesn't see very well, doesn't have great vision, doesn't really hit the hole well, but he can be an explosive runner. And I guess uh, in small doses can get you a couple of explosive plays. So if Marshawn Lloyd just kind of slots in as the number two running back, I guess you're not really mad at that. But Josh Jacobs is going to be a guy who you're hoping 250 touches of the football, maybe even more than that. 
if you want to get him even more involved in the receiving game i'm curious to see how a guy who you know fun fact for josh jacobs i guess he has about 200 career catches but he's never caught a touchdown you know 200 career catches for a guy in you know his fifth year at, at running back is pretty solid so you know considering he's never caught a touchdown that's really weird but he wanted to be utilized more in the receiving game and i wonder how much they'll get him involved for a guy who's caught 50 passes in a season multiple times and then, you know, you're hoping A.J. Dillon, his carries can go way down. I mean, ideally, I want him as low as possible because A.J. Dillon just was so bad last season. And then, you know, if Marshawn Lloyd can kind of come in every once in a while and get you a couple of nice plays, you'd be pretty happy with that. So overall, I think it's one of the better backfields in the league. I'm going to give them a B grade, and it's going to put them 12th in the NFL, but a B grade will tie you with a couple of other teams, and you can kind of fight to be in that top 10 conversation. So if you wanted to put them as a, a top 10-ish backfield in the league, that wouldn't be a bad thing to say. So you're expecting a big bounce back season from Josh Jacobs, and you know, some nice plays from Lloyd and, you know, maybe as little of AJ Dillon as possible. But overall, it's a really nice backfield with a couple of options for you. What a fun cast of young weapons that you have on this team as well. I mean, this is a group that's going to start the season as my 15th graded weaponry group in the league. But that's only just because we're waiting to see who's going to be the guy who emerges on this team and who's going to be the breakout player who can really solidify themselves as the guy. What's holding the ranking back ultimately is they don't have a number one yet. That's not to say someone on this team can't be a number one, but man, they got a lot of number twos and threes and you can certainly get by with that and you can certainly be happy with that. So. I'm waiting to see who's the guy on this team that emerges as the true go-to guy, the true number one. And if I had to pl place my bet and pick my guy, my guy is Ben Jaden Reed, who was a second round pick last season. And I absolutely loved him coming out of Michigan State, thought it was like slam and dunk pick for them. And he came in as a rookie and with Christian Watson kind of dealing with some injury troubles, I really felt like Reed at times was the number one guy that they really wanted to lean on in certain situations. And when the Packers receivers, when it came to them, it was very much they just rolled with the hot hand because you have so many options and no one's clearly significantly better than a lot of other guys on the roster so you just kind of lean into it so there were games where reed would have like 100 plus yards and i remember there was one game where he had you know come back from back to back massive games and then he had like one catch the next game because they were going to you know wicks or Dobbs or whoever the case is like they have so many options that they don't need to lean on any of these one guys but it's going to be nice when one of these guys eventually does turn into that true you know go get him the ball in the key situations i think that's where they do need to figure things out is you need to know who you can count on in the key situations and in the big moments for me i'm going with jaden reed every single time i love jaden reed but you have other people that you could really lean on because Christian Watson is a, still a favorite of many and he did deal with injuries last season, but when he was on the field, he did his thing. And yeah, he's only played two seasons and in those two seasons, he's only been able to play 23 games, but in those 23 games, he has 14 total touchdowns. So he finds the end zone when it matters and he's a true weapon for this team if he could stay healthy especially then you go to romeo dobbs who has kind of just been the, the fine player on this team definitely not like the favorite of anyone i don't know if anyone says romeo dobbs is their favorite on the packers receiving core but he's steadily been a very solid player in his two seasons and i think he is a very ideal number three receiver i think he is definitely somebody that you could count on as a third receiver and last season he definitely took a step up from his rookie season and he put up eight touchdowns through the air and was able to get about 700 yards on 60 catches he was a really solid guy to get the football to and he was someone that they did count on in certain big situations so i think as a long term like number three romeo dobbs is someone that you're excited about and then it does it end with those three because then you have Dontavian Wicks who's like a darling of many guys a lot of guys love Dontavian Wicks and it's easy to see why I mean what a find he was last year in the fifth round so you know he goes and he gets about 600 yards and four touchdowns as a rookie and he has some really big moments when he had to step in so that's four receivers there that you could count on in certain you know packages and you can spread the field quite a bit but I even think at the fifth receiver Bo Melton a former seventh 
round pick two years ago from Seattle. I thought he had some nice plays. He only had 16 catches last year for 200 yards, but I thought he had some very nice moments when it came to being a fifth receiver. I mean, if Bo Melton is your fifth, that is, that's awesome. Like you have so many options to get the football to. And I mean, like, you can go down the board, C plus, B minus, C plus, C plus, C. Like you have guys that can all viably get on the field. And, I mean, you go five wide and it's going to be hard to cover. And then you go and you look at the tight ends and say, well, you got two nice tight ends too because this team invested draft capital into tight ends and they went and got Luke Musgrave in the second round who he played pretty solid as a rookie, though he did sustain some injury troubles and he had only played 11 games. But, hey, you know what, Luke Musgrave, you, you're going to miss six games. Well, you have Tucker Kraft, who you also drafted, and Kraft came in and didn't really miss a beat. I do think Musgrave is the overall better player, but you didn't really miss that much of a beat when Tucker Kraft had to come in and play. So, I mean, that's... I just named seven guys who could be viable players for this team. The only issue is you just don't have a, an elite guy, but these guys are all so young. Someone's going to be a guy that steps up. Someone's going to emerge as the number one. Someone's going to be the guy who can go and get you a thousand yards. Somebody's going to do it. I mean, you have seven guys who are all young and I think second, third year guys, all of them. So somebody's going to emerge. If I'm, ha if I'm having to pick who's going to be the guy who breaks out and separates themselves from the pack, I think it's Jaden Reed. He is my favorite player on this receiving core, but you can all let me know who you think it's going to be. If you think it's going to be Christian Watson going crazy and getting more touchdowns, if you think Romeo Dobbs' steady increase is going to push him to be the number one, if you think Dontavian Wicks, who's, like I said, like a darling of many of the hardcore football fans, is going to be that guy, or maybe one of the tight ends. Really, it could be any one of these guys who just emerges and on any given week any one of them can go off and have a big game so it's a real hard game plan to have against this team when they don't have someone where you have to focus in and hey cover this guy it's, okay you cover you cover Jaden Reed okay we'll throw it up to Christian Watson okay cover Watson we'll go to Dobbs cover Dobbs we go to Reed cover Reed we go to Musgrave cover Musgrave we go to Wicks like who do you who do you cover you have so many options the offensive line for the Packers isn't going to grade out quite as high as it comes in, you know, in that C tier where it's about 24th in the league. And I do think, though, it has the makings of a good offensive line. It just needs a little bit more time and some more pieces. You know, they've had to deal with the struggle of knowing or not knowing if Bakhtiari is going to be playing or not. Finally, they just kind of cut that tie while they could and moved on. They drafted Jordan Morgan in the first round, who well, we'll see where he gets involved as a rookie. They do have Rasheed Walker, who could just kind of slot in as a starter if need be. It's not an absolute liability out there. And when you have Zach Tom on the other side, Zach Tom has been a really good find for them. And then you have Elton Jenkins, who provides you a lot of versatility and he's one of the better guards in the league. I have him as a top 15 guard. So you have Zach Tom, you have Elton Jenkins. That's two real building blocks for the offensive line. Jordan Morgan, you are hoping, can be that eventual left tackle for you. If it's Rasheed Walker for this season, you can get by with that. If it's Jordan Morgan, he's definitely going to be someone I think is going to be quality enough. I don't see Morgan with crazy upside. I didn't think he was some high upside player, but I do think he has you know like b type potential b plus maybe if he really hits maximizes his ability i don't think he has elite upside though but he could definitely be a really nice tackle so that's three parts right there the the struggle kind of comes when you get more to the interior aside from elton jenkins because you get to josh myers and sean ryan who not ideal starters if you have one of them starting i'm going to give this a c plus but you have two weak links in your interior and that is quite a jump having one weak link on your offensive line you can get by with having two weak links right next to each other that's gonna be really rough to get by so this is a line like i said has the makings of a good one but they need to really make a move and i'd be interested to see if there's any options available to them because i do think this is a team that can really capitalize on its young window that it has you have a lot of playmakers on you know rookie contracts and you have some guys on the defensive side of the football that 
you know, will also be pretty cheap players for now, at least. And, you know, they've cashed in trying to get Josh Jacobs and Xavier McKinney. So I'd be interested to see if this team makes a play for any sort of lineman. I think this is one of the teams where I'm like, hey, go go make a trade if you can. I don't know what the market or the availability of a lot of players is going to look like. But I think the interior of the offensive line really should be addressed if possible. This is an offensive line that genuinely, like... Hey, if Jordan Morgan's really good early on, bumps the grade up quite a bit. Or if they could go and get themselves a, a center or a guard, bumps it up quite a bit. So it's a C now, but like it's not an offensively bad line. It's not a line that's going to crush Jordan Love. It's not a line that's going to be a huge hindrance. It might hurt the run game a little bit in some aspects on the inside, but... Overall, it's a fine offensive line that you can get by with, but I'd really like to see them try and make a play for somebody here because I think they're a piece away on this offensive line. Not just from having a complete offensive line, but a complete offense because you got the quarterback, you got the running back, you got the weapons, you got some pieces on the line. Go and get you one more guy on the offensive line. This is, this is a really strong offense. I think that's like the one piece they're missing. And I, I'm glad that they tried to address it in the draft with Jordan Morgan. It's still to be determined, though, if he's going to be that guy in just not only the long term, but as it pertains to this season, if he's going to be able to slot in and be an effective starter. I think it's possible, but ultimately it's to be determined on that front. And regardless of Jordan Morgan's, you know, potential impact as a rookie, you're still gonna have a lot of things to kind of hash out on the interior and hoping that they can hold up. Now, how about my 11th ranked defensive line, a unit that I like quite a bit. It's gonna be led by Rashawn Gary on the edge and Kenny Clark on the interior, two mainstays of this team and two players who have been great for this Packers team for a long time. Starting with a guy like Rashawn Gary, who, you know, like many Packers players, do come on a little slow. I mean, we're gonna talk about that with Lucas Van Ness, another edge rusher who kind of was brought in and is gonna become brought along kind of slow because this team has him and Preston Smith on the edge. So Rashawn Gary, I mean, about as good of a player that you will find that has never had a 10 sack season. He's had nine multiple times and he has just been, you know, I think about as good of a player that a B level guy like him is. I don't think he is some high level elite number one guy, but he is a number one quality player that can get you seven to nine sacks a season and has kind of been really efficient really effective really disruptive in a lot of areas so you know he's kind of an all-around beast for this team and can do a lot of different things and he kind of does rank in that you know not quite top 10 tier i don't think he's that level of a difference maker that the guys in the top 10 are one thing i was very interested to learn about these players was you know you, you don't really pay attention to the age as much you just kind of are assuming they've been in the league for a long time and you kind of you know, lose track of it over the years but man kenny clark and and Rashawn Gary are both younger than I thought. Like, learning that Kenny Clark has been playing since 2016 and he's still 28 years old. And Rashawn Gary, who's, you know, kind of had a bit of a late, later breakout and is still 26 years old. You know, both of these guys still got a lot of great football ahead of them. So going over to Kenny Clark, he's going to be the guy who eats up the, the majority of the production on the interior. Had a career high seven and a half sacks last season and arguably played his best football last year. I mean, there's still, you know, a lot of good football ahead of him, like I said, with the age, and I was surprised to learn, like, man, he's still 28, and he's just basically hitting his prime. You'd like to think, you know, ideally, you, you'd imagine these players in their late 20s are hitting their prime. I have him as the 15th best interior defensive lineman in the league, and just like Rashawn Gary, I don't think he's quite the difference maker that uh, the guys in the top 10 are. Basically, every top 10 edge and interior guy is like a B plus type of player. So I don't quite have him as that level of a difference maker, but he's still a number one guy, a true, you know, leader in that interior room. If he's your best interior lineman, you're very happy with that. If you have two Bs on your defensive line, you know, that's going to be huge. You know, a B grade, I don't want that to be, you know, thrown around as just some loose grade. Not a lot of people get that. You know, I have my list pulled up here just for reference. B grade is the 10th through 16th interior defensive lineman. So, you know, not a lot of guys get that. 
So he's a great player, and, you know, him and Rashawn Gary tag team up to make a pretty good defensive line at the surface, you know, just looking at those two. But it's not just that you have to really lean on. If it was just those two, their grade wouldn't be a B overall for the unit. Preston Smith will come out here, and he's been a pretty consistently solid number two edge in the league for his whole career. He's been, you know, a guy who can go ever since being a second round pick for Washington back in 2015, can go and get you borderline double digit sacks. I mean, he, he's gotten 12, nine, eight, eight and a half, you know, when he's been playing, he had one down here in 2020, but you know, in terms of production, he's pretty consistent and he's more just a designated go and get the quarterback guy on this team who will go and do it at a very, solid level you know you're never asking Preston Smith to be your number one and he's just slotted in as now a 31 year old veteran as a perfectly solid and adequate C plus player for this team so you have a pretty effective edge rush duo and then on the interior you've helped pair a guy like Kenny Clark with someone with Devontae Wyatt's ability who was a former first round pick not that long ago and Wyatt has been pretty solid as well and he's still emerging and he's still getting better what's crazy is this is the crazy part Devontae Wyatt and Rashawn Gary are the same age that is insane I know that just goes to show how you know old of our prospect Devontae Wyatt was how young you know Rashawn Gary was coming out but man that's crazy so Wyatt a bit of an older player still you know only in his third year going into now but you know took a big jump five and a half sacks last year they have a bunch of guys who are not going to put up big time numbers in terms of double digit sacks but hey Preston Smith can go and get you eight Devontae Wyatt can get you five Kenny Clark can get you seven Gary can get you eight that's pretty good there and then off the bench you got Carl Brooks who was a really nice find for them you know in the, the day three he goes and gets you four sacks and you got Lucas Van Ness who they're bringing him on very slowly and I, I wasn't crazy about the draft pick when they made it I, I was just like well you don't really need him that badly it's like you could have just went in a different direction with the 13th pick but hey, he's here and you know they're gonna eventually have him be the guy who overtakes Preston Smith you know Preston Smith isn't gonna be long for this team like I said he's 31 years old so this is what the Packers do they draft for the future not for the now and you know it's worked in some instances but it's also some would say held them back in a lot of other instances you know why draft a quarterback when you have Aaron Rodgers why draft a you know Lucas Van Ness when you have a Preston Smith why draft some of these players when you have guys ahead of them you know why don't you draft someone for right now why don't you draft someone for today and you know it's been a criticism that this Packers team has faced over the years but they are a patient franchise and they are willing to sit there and wait on their first round picks and see if they can pan out they're going to do the same with Jordan Morgan they're going to do it with Lucas Van Ness they did it with Jordan Love they've done it with other players before and here is no different but you make up a, a room that has I think six viable players you have Smith Van Ness Wyatt Clark Brooks and Gary it makes up one of the better defensive lines in the league and you have two guys who are at least high level players in Gary and Clark so really nice defensive line overall for this Packers team and it's really going to help out a lot especially as we get into the linebacking room which isn't nearly as strong when it comes to those linebackers it's going to be a group that ranks very low coming in at 29th in the NFL and it's really no surprise I feel like Quay Walker has just been a, a frustrating mess of a linebacker and you know, I get it in some aspects of him just being one of those young athletic linebackers who just doesn't know what he's really doing because taking linebackers in the first round really is just a puzzling decision at this point in the NFL because no linebacker in college really is pro ready aside for maybe one or two guys. And those one or two guys typically aren't the crazy athletes. So, you know, Quay Walker in the first round was always going to be a questionable one, but he's had to go out there and play. And maybe you could see why the Packers are pretty slow to bring along their rookies like Van Ness and, and many others, because when they threw Quay Walker out there and he's had to play quite a bit early on, he has been pretty bad. So this team did invest a second round pick in Edger and Cooper. And, you know, while Edger and Cooper is a nice player and all, I just don't think that that's going to help them in the way that they really need help because Edger and Cooper is another guy who really is going to take a little bit of time. I do think Cooper is going to be better than Quay Walker, 
but I don't think it's going to be an immediate thing. They also have Isaiah McDuffie, who is not great. Like, all these guys are number twos and threes at linebacker. Probably not even number twos. More, you know, guys you'd prefer off the bench. You know, they really could have benefited with a guy like a Junior Colson instead, or even waited a little bit and took like a Cedric Gray or somebody else. I get banking on the upside. Long term, Edgerin Cooper's probably going to be the better player than a Cedric Gray. Maybe not Junior Colson. I'm a big Junior Colson fan, but in a long term, I, I get the pick in Edgerin Cooper, but for this season, it's going to be really rough. And man, it'd be awesome to have a guy like Devondre Campbell back in the building or, or somebody else. They, they should really go and see what the market has to offer in free agency because they could really use a, a veteran presence or someone to count on, someone to rely upon. It, it's a rough unit that maybe in the future if Quay Walker puts everything together and Edgerin Cooper you know, hits more of his, his ceiling as a prospect, it's going to be a, a good unit potentially. But this season, no surprise, it's going to be one of the worst groups in the league. Well, this is very similar to the defensive line. The Packers are going to come out as my 11th graded secondary at also a B grade. And a little bit like the defensive line, it's going to be led by two main pillars of this secondary, that being the new acquisition in Xavier McKinney, who I have as my seventh safety in the NFL, and Jair Alexander, who I still believe is hanging on to a top five corner spot in the NFL. Now, the pillars that they have in their secondary are definitely better than the ones that they have on their D-line. The D-line, though, does have them beat in the surrounding players, where this team doesn't have a Preston Smith or a, or a Devontae Wyatt-like player in the secondary. Their next best player is, established-wise, Eric Stokes, who is not been an amazing first round pick he's not an ideal number two corner but i guess you can get by with him in some areas this team did spend a second round pick on javon bullard who's projected to slot in as the team's safety next to xavier mckinney and i do think that that could be a very fun duo bullard was a player that i was just kind of fine with coming out of the draft i had closer to a third round grade on him you know second to third type of grade so i, I was pretty adequate with where he went in the draft going late second he should make for a fun duo with xavier mckinney so i have no problems with the safety room jair is obviously great but the rest of the cornerback room is what's going to hold this group back and really concerns me you talked about eric stokes a little bit he is far from an ideal player and the nickel corner projected to potentially be Keyshawn nixon who is ideally more of a special teamer and then you have guys like carrington valentine they drafted galen king which sure why not and Corey Ballantyne, some other players that are really not going to move the needle for this team. It's been a pretty common theme with this Packers roster that I think that they're just like a few little pieces away. The offensive line, I feel like they're just one piece away. The secondary, they're another corner away. The linebacking room, if they can get a, a veteran linebacker. Like this is a team that would be pushing top 10 if they had just a couple more pieces. So. This is a group that I really do like overall on defense. I mean, 11th D-line, 11th secondary, and, you know, not a good linebacking room, but maybe in the future it can get there. You know, you're just hoping that either Carrington Valentine can emerge, Keyshawn Nixon can do better than what he did last year, or just Eric Stokes can finally click as a true number two corner. He was a first round pick all the way back in 2021, and he just hasn't really put it together. Now this past season, he didn't really play a whole lot because he got injured, but that's also been an issue as well. Played three games last year and nine games in 2022. So maybe it's just more he hasn't been able to develop because he has been hurt. So I still think there is some optimism to have for a 25 year old player, first round pick who is going into to a contract season you would imagine that they're not going to pick up a fifth year option on a guy like him so he's got a lot to prove this year and i guess he is the player to really you know keep an eye on for the real growth of this secondary can this be a, a top 10 and beyond unit it's going to really hinge on eric stokes and maybe javon bullard as well i'm a bit more confident that bullard can at least hold his own so not a lot of worries there but they really need somebody else in this room to step up Keyshawn nixon kaylin king evan williams anthony johnson carrington valentine Corey valentine somebody needs to emerge as a player who can eat up a lot of snaps for this team and not put out bad tape or put up bad football 
I, I don't know who it's gonna be. If I guess I had to take a bet on somebody, maybe a Carrington Valentine. I, I don't really buy Keyshawn Nixon. You know, he's like I said, more of a special teamer. I don't like Kalen King and Evan Williams as rookies. Anthony Johnson was not great as a seventh rounder last year, I believe. So they need somebody to, to take a leap or somebody to emerge for this group. And that's gonna be what holds them back from being like a true certified top 10 unit. But like I said, this team is just a couple of pieces away. So, you know, it's still a nice group because you have two high end players and, you know, we'll see what we get from Bullard and Stokes this season. But this is a group that does have more potential to grow. And, and I really think that, you know, Jair and Xavier McKinney are going to mask a lot of weaknesses for this team. Well, somebody had to rank last when it came to special teams. And while I don't mind the, you know, returning aspects and the kick coverage aspects that the Packers possess, I think they are fielding the worst kicker and punter in the league. Anders Carlson has uh, a lot of a a lot of Packers fans not really happy with him after, you know, many are attributing him to being the reason they didn't beat the 49ers. But even if you take that away, you know, this is a guy that was not hitting his kicks very effectively, missed six field goals last season and even missed five extra points. So, you know, it's no surprise that when I look at their depth chart, they brought in a guy like Greg Joseph to battle with him. This is the only team that I think I've seen that has three kickers listed on their depth chart. You know, they're not sold on Anders Carlson yet. And, you know, for being a sixth round pick last year, yeah, I can see why with, with the season he put up. And then you got a punter that also wasn't all that good last year. So uh, pretty comfortably, this is the worst kicker punter duo in the entire NFL going the next season. And I wouldn't be surprised if by the time this goes up or by the time the season starts or whenever the case may be, Greg Joseph is maybe the team's kicker because he is maybe at least a little bit better or is a little bit more established. So yeah, this is the worst special teams in the league, and I don't think that's going to be too controversial to at least say they have the worst kicker punter duo in the league. Coming down to the end of this video, I have the Packers going 10 and 7 this upcoming season, and I have them taking a trip back to the postseason. I have no reason to believe that this young team that made the playoffs last year isn't going to continue to grow and get better. Jordan Love's going to keep getting better. Matt LaFleur is going to keep cooking things up on offense. You got Josh Jacobs. These young receivers and tight ends are going to keep co uh, coming along very well. You know, the offensive line is missing a piece, I feel like. The secondary, maybe it's missing a piece. The linebacking room can definitely use some help. But overall, this is a pretty nice roster and a very young roster still in a lot of areas. So, man, this team really is just a couple of pieces away from being real contenders, like true Super Bowl contenders, I feel like. Genuinely, like, left tackle figures itself out linebacker figures itself out and maybe another strong piece on defense whether it is you know an elite edge rusher that maybe lucas van Ness turns into that or maybe you know you go out and get a number two corner or, or something if you get like another big piece we really could be talking about the packers making a super bowl run now i guess with this current roster it still can happen you know if jordan love takes an even bigger leap and one of these receivers emerges and jordan morgan uh, like is really good off out the gates and javon bullard's great out the gates and you know some of these rookies and young players maybe a quay walker and edger and cooper steps up so this current roster still does have the makings of the potential to go all the way. But, you know, I'm going to just sit here and say they're a 10 win team. I think their ceiling is maybe an 11 win team and maybe their floor is still just a nine win team. I think they're a nine, 10, 11 win team, but I'm resting, you know, right in the middle saying 10 offensive MVP. It's going to be Jordan Love. I could have went with him or Josh Jacobs, but Jordan Love is going to continue to grow, I feel like. And like I said at the beginning, going to really emerge as a top 10 quarterback. And some would already say he is. I know that that argument is put out there, but um, he's on the fringe. I'm not going to argue with you if you say he's top 10. I don't think that's crazy to say, but, you know, I don't think there will be an argument for a top 10 quarterback spot next year. I think he just will be in there. Uh, defensive MVP, 
you have some options, you have a couple of high-end players, but Jair Alexander, not only is he the best player on this defense, I think he is going to have the most responsibility for a team that has a weak cornerback room to really go out there and shut down the number one team's receivers. It's something that he has done for a lot of his career, but he's going to need to really step up his game and continue to be a top five corner in the league to compensate for what has been a weak cornerback group that he has been playing with for a majority of his career. You're just going to hope that he could shut down one half of the field and you know eric stokes and whoever else is going to be playing in the nickel isn't going to be a liability offensive breakout for this team there's a lot of players i mean we talked about five wide receivers and two tight ends and they have some offensive linemen that are young but hey i staked my claim and said i'm a Jaden reed guy i think Jaden reed really takes a step up even beyond what he already is right now and i think he if i'm betting on anyone on this team to be in a thousand yard receiver i'm betting on Jaden reed and i think that he can really step into being that really high end number two to maybe a low end one but definitely like that ideal perfect number two who can crack into like the top 30 wide receivers in the nfl i have said it multiple times man i just love Jaden reed so there's that on the offensive side and on the defensive side there wasn't as many breakout candidates you know you could go to a guy like eric stokes if you really believe in him and think he's going to stay healthy you could go quay walker if you're still a quay walker believer i'm not really so i felt like the safest pick was to go with Devonte wyatt even though wyatt is a little bit older for a prospect going into his third season I still think he can emerge as a quality number two. He kind of is a quality number two right now behind Kenny Clark, but I think he can maybe close the gap between how good they are and really form a, a not just solid duo that they have now, but a really strong duo in the interior. And if that four man front of Smith, Wyatt, Clark, and Gary can really wreck things for, for opposing offenses and you get contributions from Ben Ness and Carl Brooks, then it'll compensate for the lack of deep talent in that cornerback room or maybe make up for the fact that the linebacking core isn't that strong so you know it's going to be big for the d-line to make some real growth for guys like brooks van ness and wyatt some of those younger guys to really take a step up but overall i really like this packers team and i don't think last year was a fluke i don't think jordan love is a fluke i don't think this young roster is just you know they peak too early i think this is a team that's just steadily getting a little bit better and while i don't have them you know leaping all the way up to 12 13 wins or whatever which i think would be a little unrealistic to predict i do have them getting just a little bit better and you know maybe they go and win a playoff game again this season maybe they go and take it to the 49ers again you know really compete I'm not going to be shocked if they go and replicate what they did last season. I really like this Packers team. So, you know, that's going to do it for this episode. Let me know if you agree or disagree. Like, comment, and subscribe as all of that stuff is very helpful. These videos take quite a long time to make. And as we continue this countdown nearing the top 10, I will see you guys all in the next one.